Hi, I'm Judy Rodman, your host for All Things Vocal, and along with the things that I do that are for vocal technique and helping you work your voice better for getting more impact for your messages and all that, I also do some episodes that help you with your business when you are looking for a vocal career, looking to either have one or grow one. And today's episode is one of those. So let me tell you about my guest. Vinny Potestivo is an industry-leading talent and media development strategist, widely known for launching celebrity brands and media properties that continue to influence modern pop culture. He's founder of VPE, VPE Talent, and the Verified Podcast Exchange. With over 25 years of experience, Vinny and his teams have become well-trusted connectors who sell, develop, produce, launch, distribute, and amplify talent brands such as Mandy Moore, Ashton Kutcher, Jessica Simpson, Tyrese Gibson, Lauren Conrad, Diane von Furstenberg, Danielle Fischel, Kristen Cavallari, Kelly Osborne, TJ Lavin, journalists including Su Chen Pak. I am leaving out so many celebrity names, but his list goes on forever. So I'll leave a link where you can discover more of the people that he's worked with. Formerly co-founder of MTV's talent development and original programming department, then he's gone on to cast or produce original television series, including reality TV shows like Punked, The Osbournes, The Challenge, Wild and Out, Real Housewives of New Jersey, and tons more. There have got to be a lot of backstories in there. <laughs> He's also worked with brands including Macy's, Samsung, Nikon, Major League Baseball, and again, the list goes on forever. So let's stop here and talk with a man who knows how to build visibility and success in the entertainment business, which of course includes any of you listening who want to have a vocal career. Welcome, Vinny. Oh my gosh, thank you for that. And for <laughs> spoiling me with that long, <laughs> luscious list of some of my favorite people that, that you know what, I don't know, I, I, I get a t I'll take a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of credit for the careers of those people, but also they get such a huge part of mine uh, to, have, to have launched creatively at a point in time at MTV where they were figuring out how to tell stories in a modern <laughs> way to get to be the person that helped those people. Yeah. What a gift. Yeah. I've listened to your podcast, which is called, I have a podcast. <laughs> and uh, I noticed that you, you talked about it takes a village and it truly does. And I'm so proud and grateful to be part of the village of my clients too. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. We get to kind of be part of the wind beneath their wings and uh, well, part of their journey. Yeah. There's no people like show people, right? <laughs> exactly. Ain't that, ain't that the truth? And, <laughs> and you know, we're taught that. Uh, I was in college. I'll never forget the day in acting class, acting 201, <laughs> John J. Meal. I'll never forget the day that I didn't know the lyrics to that song. And, and I'll never forget it because he's like, this is literally the only song we have in the entire industry that's about us in, in a kind, considerate way. Like, there's, there's no other song out there yet. There's no. By the way, I went to like show Exactly right. And then I went to MTV. This is me. I go to MTV. I go march right into Times Square in New York. <laughs> By the way, I pointed out I wanted to work on Broadway. So my whole MO was be a Broadway producer. I'm from Staten Island. I was going to go into Times Square, meet a couple of casting directors, a producer or somebody. I was going to watch Miss Saigon enough times <laughs> until they pulled me out of the audience and said, hey, kid, you want to produce it? But MTV actually did that. MTV pulled me out of the crowd. I got to ask Whitney Houston a question. It started with my oh. voice. The question was, Whitney, what was it like recording with Mariah Carey on the Prince of Egypt soundtrack? And I had to practice that over and over again. <laughs> and it was fun working into the camera the first time holding a microphone. People are oh, around yeah. me. And then when Whitney came out for the shoot and then the stage manager points to me and she says, he, he's going to ask the question that, 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 and I saw Whitney go, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> and I was like, no, my dream, like, this is my dreams. This is, I'm here. This is supposed to be my moment. All the plans we make. And I turned to the casting director who was so gracious to have picked me and put me in the room. And I said, look, if you need anyone else to come back, I have a small database. I'm like an Excel spreadsheet guy. I'm like, I just took out an ad on something called Backstage. I had about 700 submissions sent to my school room. So I'm putting them in a database now. If you need anybody, let me know because I have a database of talent. I didn't say, let me know how I can help you. I never even thought of 
offering up something that I didn't know how to provide. And yeah. I know a lot of, like, I just want to point out, I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing was so right. But what's wrong that I see happen is people say, how can you help me? How can I help you? When you find out how I can help you, you let me know. That's a lot of reverse ownership yeah. of that opportunity. When you know what you're capable of, of helping and also... I'm from Staten Island. My dad is a Catholic from Staten Island. My mom is a Baptist from Kansas. So I had a very radical childhood. And <laughs> I knew that in life, if someone up above sends you a message, it's like walk west or it's like build an ark. So I'm like, Yo, I, I got a database. Would you like to use my database? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not leaving things open for uh, interpretation here. I know how I can make impact. Yeah, yeah. And I was lucky that I had that in my back pocket because the stage manager heard me say that and she said, you know what? There's a recording artist named Busta Rhymes and tomorrow we're shooting a very Busta Christmas special. Would you be able to get 30 of your friends to come in? And I thought, yes, it's, I think that's yes, exactly right. That's exactly how I want to use this list. We'll all come into Times Square. We'll all be friends. We all go to school together. And I started casting my friends and people say, oh, you know, you're not supposed to do that. Why? I started working with people who knew how to yeah. perform and they would deliver and perform for me. Like I didn't realize how important that was in mm -hmm. casting to have done that. And then because of those opportunities, I fell into casting. And that's how I ended up being in the casting department, not because I'm a brilliant casting person and I learned from the best, by the way, but I can organize that structure really, really tightly. And back then there was talent contest, you know, want to be a VJ? Do you want to be a host of a show? And I remember that. We'd meet thousands of people. It was my little database that held all <laughs> the integrity of that information together. And the rest was history because, you know, when you have the power and the ability and the freedom to collaborate with creatives that have a vision that have output you know like that was my whole goal i just wanted to be surrounded by that type of person so when i got to mtv and to get on mtv or to get through you know the studio to get on the show you needed to know a talent person somehow i became one of the gatekeepers at mtv there and man i kept that door open Wow. And I'm sure there are so many offshoots of relationships that have become important from the fact that you were trying to help other people succeed as yeah. well by leaving a door open like that. Yeah. I was at a place in time where, well, first off, there, there wasn't a lot of unscripted programming out there. So there wasn't a lot of right. competition for that type of media. Mm -hmm. My job was to call people up and say, hey, uh, Wade Robson, you're a dancer. MTV should have a dance show. What would the Wade Robson dance show look like? Come on in and pitch it to us and we'll make it. Like, it was having those types of relationships that ultimately built those types of shows. Right. But again, I didn't have that type of access to celebrity or I didn't know a single person. I'm from Staten Island. That's about as close to the industry. <laughs> I mean, and there's a whole train and a ferry and then a whole nother yeah. train you got to get to get to Midtown. By no stretch of the imagination, there's no nepotism. I didn't even understand what internships were. I couldn't understand why MTV would have offices in LA when we have offices in New York and Times Square. Like I just knew what I knew, but in the yeah. 90s, that's all you were given. You didn't know what you didn't know until the internet and social media hit and you realize how much more work, to be honest, there is to do and how much more there is around us. That leads me into something I wanted to ask you, which is you and I have been in this business a long time and I've been in it forever. When I came to Nashville, there were still simul sessions where the oh, yeah. artists and the players and the background singers got to do it simultaneously. <laughs> there was a little <laughs> pressure there because editing involved blood and there were no tuners. So yeah. Wow. Been, yeah. yeah. Accuracy <laughs> and, and yeah. cooperation that has to happen for, for uh, that to be yeah. right. <laughs> But anyway, because of our history, we have seen the successful business model for the entertainment industry and strategies for successfully, you know, having a career. They've changed just radically over the years. What are some examples of what worked yesterday that don't work today? Oh, that's a great question. Um, hmm. How about waiting? <laughs> Waiting. <laughs> that's so mean. Yeah. That's like the first answer that came to waiting. That's uh -huh. really you want to you want a guaranteed go. way to fail in this industry today. Oh. Wait. You you needed 
to wait for the casting director to come into the room to signal to the producer to signal to the ep who gave the nod to all the sales and all the marketing and all those other people to give the yeah you have to wait and patiently mm-hmm. too by the way and at a very different point in time where the industry was even more corrupt because of what wasn't being talked about that is being talked about now so what what worked right. back then was waiting quiet mouthing knowing your space and time playing by the rules, um, following up when asked to. What works now is the exact opposite. Following up with fever and an excited update on the opportunity. I'm getting a podcast deal and I wanted to know if you're still looking at me for a host. I'm getting an opportunity to record an animated film that's going to take three months of my time. I wanted to see where you were at with your independent film right now, because that's a, it's a really important project and I really would love to be a part of it. We now have so much more control over those opportunities. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. so much more freedom. I mean, right. unfortunately, you no longer need me to tap you on the shoulder to say, hey, this is the right mm-hmm. time and place. Right. Now you're getting discovered. Let's go do a casting and see what happens. Now you can take control. You, know, you don't have to wait for the casting to happen, right? Exactly. I totally agree because in the old days, the... Um, Labels used to see someone, you know, or hear of them in a, a club or they would pop in and play something for them on their guitar and they would sign them and then they would develop them. And of course, that doesn't happen now. But the other thing is the labels were the bottleneck. There was the top, mm-hmm. you know, top four or five labels. If you're not on that, you're not on anything and you can't reach anybody because, you know, there was no internet that was widely known to play your music and reach people. So there was a bottleneck and the labels took care of the artist development. And now the bottleneck is broken. So what I'm allergic to is whining because if you want to bad enough, like you say, don't wait you know, start the ball rolling. It's like you're saying we have to roll the ball, but the cool thing is we can. Yeah. Whereas we couldn't before. Yeah. Yeah. So. We we can roll the ball and I can get it started. That's powerful. That didn't used to happen yes. five years ago, let alone. You're really seeing it with Taylor Swift. I bring up Taylor Swift a lot. Oh, yeah. You want to ask me, oh, what's yeah. the best, whether you're a doctor, a dentist, a stand-up comic, a teacher, doesn't matter. If you were to say to me, who, what's the best brand out there right now? Who's got the marketing right? Who, who I should be modeling my strategy? Taylor Swift. Mm-hmm. She's like mm-hmm. a person to person brand. I've never seen Beyonce is right there. Adele also right there. It's yeah. a couple of artists that control their music. So the first off, the user experience is more important than ever. We understand that. And the user right. experience now bleeds well past buying the album, but down to purchasing the tickets. We heard the lashback that the country had, the world had with Taylor Swift, right? With Ticketmaster, that that user experience is vital to how she as a brand will flourish in the future. And she's now been given the opportunity to be part of that change, which Mm -hmm. is, you know, when you can be part of change, jump, jump and leap at that opportunity, right? Like that's, but it's the people who own their content that tend to be in that space. Beyonce has done some really killer deals that we've heard about in the past. And it seems like a real forward thinking model for how some people, specifically vocal artists might think in the future. Yeah, I'll do a collaboration with you, but I'm also going to record 50% more and we're going to own that differently. And you're going to support my project as much as you're asking me to support your project. So yes, I'll be in the new Lion King, but I also am going to create my own content from it. And I'm going to impact your content without a doubt, because that's, you know, what I do and I'm responsible. And also I'm going to allow you to impact mine. Is that reciprocity? Yeah. And owning your audience. On the front end. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that's big, owning your audience. These are things that labels like to do, networks Mm -hmm. like to do. Mm -hmm. Network is a funny word. We think of networks as a TV network, but a TV network is a network of video, a network of ads, a network of talent, a network of, um, so you sort of go down the list of, yeah. of like what, what these networks are built out of when we can own our audience that allows us to combine audiences. That's where community happens. And when, oh, yeah. when we can make community happen, mm-hmm. two artists coming together, two audiences combined, oh, yeah. one solid community. Festivals are thriving right now. In my opinion, I think festivals will continue to thrive because mm-hmm. vocal artists have found a way to build a real sincere, authentic, transparent relationship with them. 
I'm thinking right now of Mandy Moore, who is an amazing vocal artist, a solid friend of mine that I've known since she was 15. And we, we worked at MTV together forever, who now does not gate her content, her media, her music, and does not get approval for any of that through a label. And it's all independent and it's all owned. And there's a lot of authority that comes in that. I had this conversation with Mandy Moore about creating space to step into your mm -hmm. authority. It's mm -hmm. actually, um, with Mandy, self-confidence was the first obstacle when she was like 15, 16. Self-authority for her didn't kick into place until about five years ago, until well after Rebecca Pearson had entered our lives. And she's like, you know what? This this role, everyone knows <laughs> Rapunzel and that. Like, I got to step into what's been given to me. And in doing that, oh my gosh, my voice drops because like the empower, oh, we have to <laughs> listen to Mandy Moore talk about when she accepted authority, you know, so many of us want to build authority. A lot of us don't realize that it's just accepting it. You have to accept it to build it. And, and that's, I think, a big thing. That's a big difference between, you know, what worked back then and, yeah. and what works yeah. now. Yeah, that was And then freedom, fun. the freedom to do what you want. Mm -hmm. I would rather you come in and rock an audition the way you wanted to and not get it and have you leave that room and be like, at least I did it my way. And when they're ready to do it my way, they can come get me. Because right. the last thing you want to do is do it in a way that, not to say other people's ways aren't going to be as good or better than yours, but, but why? And there's so many things, why, factors that factor into it that you yeah. can't control. Yeah. You know, maybe they and want somebody taller than you. Or yeah. Taller. And there are so many things that we can control yeah. now. Audio, really, audio pioneered the space of IP in America. When I sell a show to a network, the network owns it 100%. When I sell mm -hmm. it to Sweden, I'll do a deal with Sweden where I'll retain ownership of it. Then I bring it back to America and I license that show and I get paid differently and I get paid more and you know all matters differently. Podcasting single-handedly changed the game of creating content. I can do more converting a podcast into a TV show or a film or a book. I have more access from podcast to something wow. than book to something or film to something or even album to something. And podcasts wow. can be tricky to nail, but you're set up for success if you don't get lost in the tricks, you know, yeah. getting it wrong with audio can be, as long as you have the right equipment, you know, there's a couple of checkpoints with video, there's a little bit more room for error with audio, you know, it's a little bit easier to sort of hit the nail on the head yeah. and get there to 100%. So audio, again, social audio, clubhouse, LinkedIn audio live, and what's happening now in podcasting with podcasting and narrow casting and low bandwidth and high, you know, audio is really changing the game and will have a huge impact in the content that we're seeing in film and in TV. And we can make such quality audio recordings now where before we had to go in the studio. So yeah. it's just so much more economical. I mean, I can't believe I never wanted to be an engineer. I was, <laughs> no, I'm the voice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on a need to know basis. Right. I don't need to know that. Well, during the pandemic, yeah. I had to learn to do that. So I bought my gear, bought my SM7B and yeah, that's that. it. And now I'm, you know, on records and doing my own demos and all kinds of stuff. Also and now you don't have to hire podcast. someone to do that anymore. Just, right. I just have to remember to turn the reverb off when I'm doing <laughs> podcasting. <laughs> yeah. I would have liked it. That would have felt, it would have felt like a Sunday sermon that I see on TV. You know, I was ready for a yeah. little reverb, reverb. Are you ready <laughs> to get discovered, discovered, discovered? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, the power of voice. You know, this is the year. This is the year of the power of voice. Ah. There's so much chat about chat GPT, yeah. about oh, yeah. how the words, you know, the story, has a lot of focus on the story, by the way. Mm -hmm. Everyone yeah. says, is, you Everyone. know, story matters, story matters. Story matters if the source matters. Source yeah. is everything. It's the characters and it's the truths in those stories that, that won't change. The stories will change depending on the podcast host, the narrator, the audience. The story always changes. Mm -hmm. You know, think of like the great nursery rhymes that have changed, whether oh, it's yeah. because of Andrew Dice Clay or our own version of those. How we tell the story. You're That's it. Right. That's How really we tell it. The story depends Who's telling on it? to whom we are talking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And our voice. Our voices, you know, there's some weird AI that's been floating around a little bit for sure in podcasting that can take some of our words and, you know, try to mimic us. I don't think it anywhere as close to as yeah, strong as 
the written words of chat GPT or the visual words of some uh -huh. of those other filters I've seen. Uh -huh. So I'm not completely convinced yet in the words, but that's because I pay attention to inflection and tonality. There's uh -huh. so much more in our voice than just oh, yeah. our voice. Oh, right oh, now yeah. the AI is getting voice, but it's not getting tonality. Yeah. It's not getting structure. Those are, oh, I'm going to tell you, you know, t t tonality exactly. is, a, is a physical, that's the <laughs> physical structure of your voice. You know, that's me. Oh yeah, that's Vinnie Potestivo. Like that's that's the unique thing about this. And yeah, I've anyway. got a little acting exercise that I give my students where I talk about the words "I am an aardvark," and I'll give them four different scenes that are completely mm -hmm. different, where they're talking to completely different people and they're wanting completely different responses. And I'll, we'll go through those scenes. And we have a lot of fun. At the end, I'll say, "Now, did your voice change with you talking to someone different and wanting a different kind of response?" Well. Yeah. Did yeah. your body language change? Uh, yeah. Did those things go together? Yes. And so the voice, you know, only exists to deliver messages. Mm -hmm. We've got to know who we're talking to, even when we can't see them. But let me regress here. And let me ask you about something I know you're an expert at. Okay. And that is, like we talked about in the old days, record labels did artist development. And now we are doing our own. Yeah. At least at first. And we're also uh, developing our own fan bases at first, because that's what the labels are looking for. That's mm -hmm. the currency that they're looking for. The proof, if right? you don't have, yeah, that, pr yeah. that social proof. And so what would you tell that artist? Do you agree that by the time you do do a record deal, it should feel more like you're doing a joint venture? Yeah, well, yes. So first off, Artist development, by the way, TV development was very similar. I worked a lot with artist development, A&R, mm -hmm. as they call it. There's this whole section, this whole subcategory of business that happens just outside of the core company. Yeah. So that what happens inside the core company is spent on dollars that are going to turn into sales. And what agencies, like what networks did also, and then what labels did was empowered A&R executives, a couple of key people that they knew, knew the inner workings, how to build an audience, how to create an actual album, how to put merch together. Some of the basics that- Talk that to media. That, yeah, that you're right. All the training that we think that you know everyone knows. The labels took a step back and said, "We're going to let you focus on development, and we're going to focus on publishing and discovery and visibility. All we're going to do is push your content out there, but your content needs to be great. And we're not going to tell you how to make great content. We're going to tell you if it's great." Which is like, yeah. what a weird thing. And I, I can't, <laughs> I remember when Columbia told Jessica Simpson, she had to go back in and re-record songs because she sang songs that like no one else could sing. And it was sung in a way that was, you know, what we like singing like Jessica. I'm like, who sings like Jessica Simpson? She's always sung yeah. so well, unique. But, Garth Brooks was turned down by every label. In uh, oh before. yeah, I can, I, you know, I, I'll say this respectfully because I brought Taylor up as the queen of all things. In yeah. MTV in 2006, if Taylor came into my office and said, I want a reality TV show, I would say, so does everybody else. <laughs> you know? You but there's something know. about her. There's something about her that I see that I recognize in Mandy also. Just mm -hmm. present. At, at a TV network where things are so frantic, when someone is present, they yeah. stand out more. And Times Square, where everyone's buzzing around, jumping around, you yeah. do time lapse of Times Square. Who who do you see? The person who's standing still. Yeah. The person with presence, with a strong point of view. Taylor always had that and a really strong connection to writing out what her point of view was. Where Mandy, I think, tapped into the emotional component and allowed us to understand what she was going through emotionally, even, mm -hmm. you know, not through any reason other than just how she presented her songs, her music her acting ability in television too. So my department was first created in 99 as the talent development department. We were created to start figuring out how to start working with talent in a unique way. Mm -hmm. At first that looked like casting Beyonce in a movie called Carmen, a hip hop bra. We put Mandy Moore in a TV show called together, which was like our fake boy band show. That was a movie. And uh -huh. it looked like stunt casting. And then I was hiring VJs and hosts. And one day I went down to the studio in early 99 to see someone start their, their first hosting gig. And the guest was Will I Am, who was on that show. Wow. And after the 30 second TV show was done, Will turned to his manager and said, this guy is new and he gets 30 minutes on the show and I have the number one video and I got three minutes in the show. He's like, what do I got to do to host a show around here? 
And literally everyone in the room looked at me and I was like, <laughs> oh. I was like, I'm in the room. This is what they say. They say it's all about who's in the room. And if you're in the room, there's a responsibility to be there. Cause what ha- the as a happens. creative, you know, like this is where you have to learn to speak quickly. You, you've been in recording sessions with one presenters who, you know, it's the silence <laughs> until it's, yeah. and then all of a sudden the show it's done and you're like, wait, but, uh, but that was my lyric. I wanted to get, and I saw that happen. The speed that needs to happen. A lot of that comes from structure and that's what A&R does. A&R puts structure to the career of an artist. They say, when an artist has fans, here are a couple of core organizing groups of fandom that will help. Here's maybe a sports approach if we wanna do something sporty. MTV had Rock and Jock Music Festival back before ESPN2 took all the guys that used to watch MTV, they say, away from us. There used to be these like sports and these like big athletic events that happened. So. How we tapped into artists back then were different because it was marrying the artist to something to impress. Mm -hmm. They had to come out with an album so they can get on late night shows so they can talk about marriage equality and same sex equality and and equal pay rights. They had to come up with an album to do that. (laughs) All of that changed when social media you know, happen. And now, and now that they can create their own audiences too. So a lot of A&R people became talent development or TV producers. There's a lot of A&R executives Ah. that I've worked with that are TV producers. Why? Because they have the inside track to what the label's really going to do. You said it, the label's got four or five priorities. Okay. Here's a great example. At MTV, we would get pitched, oh, major recording artist, you know, is about to come out with their album next week. Let's do a show. And we would say, but it's done like making it and all the risk and it's all done. And then you're going to come into us and tell us they're a priority. And then they're not when they don't play at radio and you don't keep them as a priority. Mm -hmm. So how is that set up for success? So I had this in the back of my mind when I found out, well, first off, Ashley Simpson is an amazing musician. She actually has more charted number one hits than her sister. Her sister has more songs that have charted Jessica has a ridiculous amount of catalog that's been top 10, but Ashley is an amazing singer and has had more number one hits than Jessica does, despite less volume. Ashley was getting a deal and it wasn't signed yet. And we knew she would be a a priority to the label, but there was no guarantee. And we can't guarantee for ethical reasons. And unfortunately, something happened live on SNL, wrong song got played and Ashley wasn't given the training to deal with a situation that happened like that. And unfortunately, as the call events happened, she did like a little farmer's jig, I think they call it on, on SNL. They cut to commercial. Look, media is tough and I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is not a joke. It is, it is not a secret that media has always been tougher, in my opinion, on women than men. But they didn't let Ashley have that mistake and learn again. That was one of the things that really sped up her show, not returning back to MTV. People didn't understand if she was truly connected to her art the way that she was, all because, and I talked to Joe Simpson, so this is the truth. What happened Mm -hmm. is generally speaking in a band, the drummer is the person who has to start a song. It's usually on the beat that that person, if they're going to be playing to music or some type of soundtrack, it's usually on the pedal. And what happened is it was this drummer's first time being on SNL as well. He was terrified, nervous, energy. He didn't advance the song. And instead of going forward, he went backward. So a couple of things happened. He didn't have training in the footwork. There shouldn't have been more than two options on that disc they were playing. There shouldn't have been a backwards and a forward. There should only be two things. So we learn, you know, we learn how to, from our experiences, but all that being said, the development that happens now outside of our products being TV or an album, that same team is the team that usually is the team that's helping us amplify and maximize that product as well. So Mm -hmm. the same team that's developing us is the same team that's actually executing the creative, the content, the touring, the user experience of the brand. Yeah, I would be an a and if I wasn't in talent development. Those are my closest friends, the people who are up way later than me recording songs about things that make you cry for years and years and years. They go there and then they come back with these yeah. beautiful pieces. And more importantly, relationships. Yeah. That's the thing I'll say about A&R. It's as much about patient, nurturing, collaborative, patient, patient, patient relationship where you're supporting the goals of the artist, but you're also aware that it takes time. 
mm-hmm. but also you have to be prepared for when that moment happens. So in your patience, yeah, you're taking a lot of efforts and actions into accountability to make things happen. Right. And to revisit what you were just talking about, when things go wrong, and yeah. if you've got a long career, there are things that are going to go wrong and sometimes mm-hmm. badly wrong. Sometimes you can control them and sometimes you absolutely have no control over them. But whatever it is, I think an artist really needs training in what to do when things go wrong, right? Yeah, crises, right? Crises, crises. training. There was a, a real fire. I was doing Damn Yankees <laughs> in college and the scrim caught on fire and oh, the stage manager called fire. the show off. She said, stop, but then people on stage didn't know and we didn't really kind of know what was happening. No one got hurt. But there is an example of like, we didn't understand. I'd never been in a situation where a show stopped. No one ever says, walk off stage quietly. Now, when you watch professional theater, I've been in professional theater where something happened in the house, the house lights stay down because they don't want everyone in the house to see what's happening. Mm -hmm. The person who's sick or ill or whatever is removed from the house. And then a couple of minutes later, a stage manager in England, I saw this, it was Peter Pan. And then the stage manager came on, she said, you know, we were in the middle of the scene, actors take your cue, and the actress came on very professional. And she said, I'm getting goosebumps, I never told the story. And she goes, and action, and it's literally, oh my gosh. It's like this moment where I was like, oh, this is this is collaboration. I remember thinking, this is artistry. Do you know where else I saw something similar to that? And I'm yeah. laughing because of the answer, Spider-Man the musical. <laughs> Right? We're like, is it going to get caught? Is the web going to get caught? How are people going to act? Are they going to be able to finish the song or not? Like, <laughs> there was that that piece where we went, King Kong, I think, had some, had, you know, there's a big animatronic. I think it had some difficulty too. But Spider Man, I know. I was actually doing a musical theater a stand in on one of the plays that I've been working on. And in the scene, it was a big, you know, community, a bunch of actions going on during the singing of the song and all that. And so we were on an elevated platform. Well, one of the boards was loose and my heel went through it. <laughs> and all you can do is just go, you know, <laughs> keep on. But it's just like the bus transmission going out and things go wrong. And you, yeah, right? you're going to be uh, out there and you, it takes courage to be publicly visible with yeah. your art because yeah. then it gets judged. There's like a couple of ways, you know, people can prepare for that. One, it's the Beyonce method. The show must go on. Uh-uh, nothing wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> and did, did just miss one little step, but that was supposed to look like that, you know, just yeah. push power through power performance, right? The second thing you can do um, is incorporate it. This mm-hmm. is probably what I'm more prone to do. Mm-hmm. You know, the, in my college performance of Damn Yankees, I was a baseball player that was like, someone must have hit a home run. It smells hot in here. Does anybody even smell flint? Like I was, I didn't know what to do, but I incorporated it in the now. I couldn't figure out where we stopping or were we going further? So I was like, let me just be in the middle and incorporate it in. And, and then there's a Patti Lapone method, which is stop the damn show. How many times do I have to tell you not to record this musical? Uh, you know, it, but as a performer, you have the option, you have the choice and you have the freedom and you pay the repercussions on all of them mm-hmm. to let the audience feel how you feel to get the message that you feel is important. Look, sometimes we have to stand up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Mm -hmm. enough is enough. Sometimes we can't be quiet about what we see. And I laugh because with Patty, (laughs) notoriously, it happens to be about picking up the iPhone and and recording content in the theater, (laughs) which violates, as you know, it violates everything sacred about how we're supposed to treat this material that we're gifted, right? Right. So it almost violates that relationship there and it exploits it in a way that... Almost it makes us feel, yeah, like a product and not a performer. And that's not what we're looking for. You know, we're people. And if we're not treated like people, then you're going <laughs> to feel the wrath of people. Like I'm thinking of Taylor Swift again when she, was, when she wasn't given access to the catalog. Yeah. Like people didn't look at her as a business and say, oh, well, she missed out on that business opportunity. They say, like, what woman? Who isn't given an opportunity mm-hmm. to, you know, like, and, and now, to be honest, in this creator economy that we're in, we're finally starting to see contracts that are a little bit closer to the middle, if not more favorable yeah. for creators. We have a lot more say, yeah, a right. lot more control and freedom. Right. A lot more places, by the way, there's Grammys for TikTok sounds now. A lot oh more places God, for our content to be seen. Yeah. Well, um, let's the, let's get into that. What are some things that we can do to increase our chances of getting discovered, being more visible? You've talked about some. Oh, of yeah. But what are some specific things that we can do 
besides, you know, just throw the videos out wherever we can. Yeah. Well, first off, shorts. best new artist. I mean, how many platforms create best new artists? Best I will tell you as someone who's made a career out of finding people, trying to be the first to find this person, trying to say, I saw him first. Yeah, yeah. It's my ego, my ego. Yeah. You know, this is my at work, you know, I, all the discovery things. There's a, a brilliant way to start reverse engineering. So one of the things I would do is start looking at some of the print platforms, media platforms that support emerging artists, that support first time wins. Mm -hmm. There's structure now. New Music more, Weekly is a big one. Yeah. And I mean, I can think of cultural communities, religion, gender, sexuality. I, I can see how all of those words fracture what I'm talking about here in terms of finding an organization that supports the development of a brand new voice, a brand new artist. Mm -hmm. So not only do I know there are organizations solely focused on that, but there are organizations that include the beginning part of the journey because they love talking about the experts like Grammys, Oscars, you know, we hear best right. new artists. There's a reason why the community is supportive um, of new artists. It's really hard for a new artist to break through, but it's really important for them to do so. And yeah. without our support, it won't happen. Yeah. And we have to see change. The same way that the audience is changing, what's on stage needs to change. So like yeah. first and foremost, awards, to be honest, while we're on this category mm -hmm. of like, awards are annual. Mm -hmm. Like there's a <laughs> Oscars every single year. Mm -hmm. There's a Grammys every single year. In fact, there's Emmys national and there's Emmys that are local. You can win an Emmy for really? like just having something air in Florida. I won a local Emmy last year. It's the first time I ever won an Emmy. See my little lady Emmy. She's right there over I my shoulder. Her. Yeah. I said, how come I never won an Emmy before? Oh, well, I've never been nominated. How come I never been nominated before? Oh, because you never replied. How come I never replied before? <laughs> and then I went and found the project. I found a short form documentary because I wanted to make immediate impact. Yeah. And I knew I'm going to win an award. So now I'm like, this award needs to be worthy of me because this is yeah. going to be attached to my name yeah, right. attached for to a long name. time, you know? So then I thought, well, what award do I want to win for? Like what, what deeply meaningful award could I, you know, really help? And I found a project called Red Flags. It follows the journey of a woman out of rehab. So where a lot of people focus on, I see you have a problem. Let's get you into an intervention and get you into rehab happily ever after. It, yeah. Unfortunately, my childhood wasn't like that. And my yeah. parents were not, that's not where the work even comes close to beginning, right. by the way. Right. So it's called Red that's Flags. And much. I got to make it with Kevin Harrington, who was one of the original sharks on Shark Tank, and Jeff yeah. Hoffman, who uh, is an amazing philanthropist and a, the, one of the kindest men I've ever met. And he put the kiosks in airports. Like, this is the guy who said, he, we don't got to wait in lines anymore because Jeff Hoffman is a good name to know. <laughs> My friend Brandon T. Adams and uh, and Samantha T. Rosen, who we follow, and it's an impactful journey, but like even more so because that's how I won my Emmy. 25 years of, of being in TV, it took me to realize that I need to apply for an Emmy. You mentioned something earlier. What is something that didn't fly back then that might fly now? And when it comes to winning awards, yeah. so most awards in TV at least will be submitted by the TV network or the production company. Very rarely does the actor have a say in what they're going up with because there's compliance. I need to look like a team player. And if HBO thinks I'm not going to win best supporting lead and they think someone else is going to, then for the betterment of the project, I need to take a step back and trust that the platform knows what they're doing. But I have to be honest, that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm seeing now is actors stepping out of that line and submitting themselves because you're completely mm -hmm. allowed to. Uh -huh. And you can submit yourself it's and it's very different than, yeah. than Again, waiting wait. for someone else to, to decide right. if or if not you're worthy. Like we have freedom. We have yeah. options now. So get to work. <laughs> get to, yeah. yeah. Get to work and make it work. How about that? Like I also know in A&R and, and, and development, some of what I have to do is get the ball rolling and I have to make it really easy after I'm done. I have to be able to step back because if I can't step away from the pitch, and you rely on me to get the project moving, it's not going to move further than me. I want mm -hmm. it to be bigger than me. So I have to make sure on paper that you have what you need. The write-up is crystal clear and clean. I understand the audience. I understand the, the MO. I can prove 
that it exists. Like you talked about, really, we have to prove there's an audience. Mm-hmm. You have to do headcount of performances. That's what I'm doing in podcasting right now. I think that's why I'm able to move podcasts into TV shows and other projects because I'm able to prove there's an audience. It's viable. Yeah. Huh. That's fascinating. It's really fascinating. Okay, I've got one little uh, specific thing to ask you. Something I know that's changing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's great to have a website and give some free something where people can sign up for it and then you capture their email addresses and you don't have to worry that TikTok's going down if you've got their email address, right? <laughs> right. So, but these days, the younger demographics tend to prefer texting over email. I know my niece, if I email her, I can forget ever having sent it at all. (laughs) And she works for Indeed. She's brilliant. She's a math whiz. And she just does not like email. But how do people capture uh, phone numbers? Do you do that on the website? Yeah, called SMS marketing. Okay, SMS marketing. Uh, And SMS marketing is, so there's two types of texting that are out there. Um, Text with font and color and words, and then just plain old fashioned letters, right? Like that's kind of like what Twitter was almost based on. SMS marketing is short messaging service. And it specifically would look like this on Instagram. It'll say, text me at my phone number. And then when you text that number, you'll get an auto response that says, would you like to join the list? You're probably on maybe a couple of these SMS marketing lists for maybe if you shop at Macy's or a department store that you might work on. Um, most of us probably don't like the SMS text messages that we get, but we yeah. probably, I don't. probably still subscribe to a couple. And we actually probably still click on like maybe one or two of them. Like we'll subscribe to 10, we'll delete eight out of 10 of them. But the two that we do allow to land in our phone, which is connected to our head, connected to our hand in a private space to take action on it. And it's a really, really smart way to take action. If you want, if you want action, as you're pointing out, from maybe a younger audience or an audience that needs to be alerted of something that you're doing now. Mm-hmm. So maybe marketing executives, doctors, lawyers, like people who have information that their audience needs to know of the second of the minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, retailers are flash sales, and you know for that right. opportunity, it's just another way onto your device. You know, like I still rely pretty heavily on email marketing um, as a blogger. Yeah, As a blogger and as a yeah. podcaster, email marketing works better for me. If maybe I had like a younger audience on my podcast and like I can see my audience is listens to my podcast on Apple, which signifies to me that they're not the younger audience that listens yeah. to my podcast on Spotify. But if I was trying to target that audience for opportunities, also for artists, it's killer. I've talked a lot about Mandy Moore in this episode, but I've seen Mandy has a number that she gives out and people sign up for it. And what it allows her to do now that you can't do in email fragments the way that you can with the phone is that it can actually target you based on where you live. So it's like, yeah. hey, I'm coming, I'm going to be oh, in yeah, town right. next sure. month. Right, right. Would you like to come? Right. So now you have the ability to really start to laser target people. Yeah. You can fragment your email list. It's a lot more difficult to do that. You need a lot more information from the person Mm-hmm. to be able to understand what that is. But mm-hmm. with your phone number, there is information associated with that phone number. How do I say this? So if your phone number has a certain area code to it mm-hmm. and it's confirmed to be in that location and Amazon knows that for a fact, if I'm looking at, I don't know how to describe right. <laughs> right. In, in other words, you only need to tell the information about your phone number once. Anyone who has access to your phone number on one of those SMS marketing services mm-hmm. has a lot of information about your phone number and what's attached to it, your home, where you're at, your usage. Oh, yeah. More the time more you're on, the time you're off. Emails, yeah. What time are you most likely to have the phone in your hand so yeah. I can text you when it actually, you know, so there's a yeah. lot more laser focus on that. That's like a mixture of uh, geo targeting, you know, geo targeting and email marketing put together is the, yeah. the land right there on your Fascinating. phone. Fascinating. That's a whole podcast episode in itself. Listen, Vinny, thank you so very much. This yeah, has been a fascinating you. conversation. And I could talk to you for a few days. All right. <laughs> but, um, Sounds like I'm coming back. Sign what's me up. <laughs> cool. Yeah. What, and what's really cool is I'm hearing the marketing part and the promotion part of our artistry uh, tied to 
the messaging. And that's why yeah. I'm so all about that. Like, who am I? What message do I want to give the world? What, what impact do I want to make with my influencer status? And if you put that together with the marketing, then like Seth Godin says, marketing can be a holy art because you're yeah. actually making the world better. So it's, I love Seth Godin. And the word is can. Yeah. The, the word that Seth nailed in that phrase is can. Artists should be making content that we can, not that we should. We should be publishing content that we should. But don't let what we're publishing dictate what we're creating and create what you can and know that in the future. And if you're listening to this podcast, hopefully in your lifetime, you've seen hundreds of TV channels get added to cable. You now know that we can add lots more digital spaces. So, you know, the shelf space is expandable. So create what you can. Right. This is the most important message that I can put out there and then trust that either the right time will come to be, the right power will come to be, the right audience will come to be, the right uh, passion will come to be, the education might be that things will change. Yeah. And when they do, you're ready to right. share and publish that content that right. you're capable of creating. So Vinny, where can we find you and the services you provide in your podcast? Well, I have a podcast is on I have a podcast.com. And also I do featured podcaster articles on the podcasters that I meet. So please cozy up, check out all the awesome people that I'm exploring and celebrating. And if you have any favorite podcasters out there that you'd like me to know of, make sure that I have that information. I hang out on LinkedIn a lot. So if you have any cool. questions, you just want to bump into me at the water cooler, the water cooler <laughs> moments happen for me on LinkedIn, Vinny Potestivo there. And I, I talked about awards. I talked about how to get profiled on IMDB. And I have step-by-step yes. -step instructions on all of that on vpe.tv is the source for my creator hub where I list everything. There's no gates. There's no information needed other than what I'm giving you. And I implore you to use it. And then like, take definitely. screenshots and share it because sharing is a universal action that leads to growth and, and discovery. So share, tag at Vinny Potestivo. And I appreciate the space, the time, the energy, and I can't wait to see what you create. Yeah. I cannot wait. <laughs> okay, Vinny. Great. Well, please keep in touch. And yes, yeah. be done again. We'll we'll revisit and see where the world of the entertainment industry and marketing. Uh, where are we off to next? Go, yeah. <laughs> it's a journey, I tell you. I'm excited. Oh my gosh. It's a big journey, and I'm excited for what's coming my way. All right, Vinny. Well, thank you very much. Bye.